market under Pretext online course. So there are people online here that will hear Dr. McCloskey. And of course, this is live, so thank you for coming. So Dr. McCloskey needs no presentation. She is a uh, distinguished scholar, Professor Emerita at the University of Illinois of English, History, Economics, and Communication, I think. <laughs> and uh, right now he is uh, at Washington at the Cato Institute, right? I am. So, so she has worked on economic history and cultural economics and a lot of things. So without much ado, please. So you, you, but let, let's make sure we know what the topic okay. is. Yeah, so equality permission, kind of to, 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 your, your conference or like talk about yeah, equality yeah, that's permission. Right. That's what I thought, but yeah. I just want to make sure that, yeah. you know, although I was in Perth at the, at the University of Western Australia a long time ago when I was an assistant professor. And I thought I had two presentations. We were having tea, and my host said, well, now we're going to go have the presentation. And I thought, oh, OK, this must be one of the two. And it was a third presentation they hadn't told me about. So I come into the room. There are 100 people there. He turns to me and said, we'll have your lecture now on Victorian economic failure. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> and it turned out that you can work on three levels at once. You can, what's coming out of your mouth, what you're going to say in a few minutes, and what the overall structure of the lecture is going to be, as long as you know what you're talking about. And I'm not sure if I know what I'm talking about in, in, in political theory. That's what I want to, I want to, uh, uh, present this afternoon. I'm an economist and an economic historian. Um, and in the last 10 years, I've gotten more and more alarmed at the anti-liberal um, tendencies of recent politics. And now I understand the word. I, 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 I stutter on my favorite word, liberal, or liberty. I always do. It's very irritating. Um, but I've been alarmed by the challenges in uh, Latin America, in, in Europe, of course, in, in the United States, uh, or virtually everywhere. The challenges to, to, to liberalism, understood in the way that the Tocqueville would have understood it, or Abraham Lincoln, or uh, Adam Smith, uh, one of the first of the, of, the, of the liberals of the 18th century, um, namely, as Smith expressed it, the obvious and simple plan of natural liberty, uh, by which he meant a small state, to provide for some things, neither Adam Smith nor I are, are, were, were our anarchists, but, but a small state, <laughs> and, and a st state constrained to not um, massively interfere in the economy. Adam Smith was, of course, arguing against, in, in the Wealth of Nations, the commercial system, as he called it. That's just to say mercantilism. And from both the left and the right, and even the middle, I think we're reestablishing a kind of mercantilism. The size of the modern state is gigantically larger than it once was, say, 100 years ago. Um, and as Lord Acton said famously, power tends to corrupt absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so the dangers to individual liberty are great. Now, it, one point of terminology that I think we've got to, um, we've got to think about. Isaiah Berlin, the great English philosopher who became a historian, an intellectual historian. Actually, I have a chair at Cato called the Isaiah Berlin Chair of, 
of liberal thought, made a distinction between what he called negative liberty and positive. Negative liberty is what I'm talking about. It's the, um, uh, the, the constraints on the government relative to individuals, families, um, corporations, associations. It, uh, the, the government of Pennsylvania um, uh, does not, is not to interfere in the U University of Pennsylvania. Now it does, but let's, 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 let's pretend it doesn't. So that's, that's negative. Positive liberty is the provision of goods and services, of opportunities, you might say, by the government, by the government. In 1941, in January, Franklin Roosevelt, in the... Um, in the State of the Union address, spoke of the four freedoms, uh, uh, speech, religion, then freedom from fear. He was speaking in the early days of the Second World War, so fascism was the issue. The fourth one was freedom from want, in accord with his attempts in the, in the 30s to um, make the country prosperous again, make the United States prosperous again. And freedom from want is, in Berlin's terms, positive. And, but, but I think there's a great confusion about this. My friendly acquaintance, Amartya Sen, wrote a book in 1999 called Development as Freedom. And what Amartya meant and what uh, Martha N N Nussbaum, his friend and in, in many ways and co-author, have in mind is, a, the, is, that, is that poor people need to be provided with a basic subsistence in order that they're free to exercise their freedom. Now, I, I think that's a modern and fundamental confusion. In languages like Spanish and the Romance languages generally, or the Germanic languages such as German and Dutch, which have only one word in, in, in uh, Spanish, the, the, uh, I'll do it in Italian because I know a little Italian, Liberta um, and German Freiheit. Um, they don't have, well, I, I hesitate to say this because I'm not sure, but there's less of this confusion. There's, whereas in English we have two words always. We always have the Germanic word and then beside it we have the French or the Latin origin word. And once they meant the same thing, until really the 19th century, liberty and freedom on English tongues meant not being a slave, not being subordinated by physical coercion to some other human being. But this word freedom got out of its cage and expanded to include what we call wealth, income, material sufficiency, you know, enough to eat, health care, et cetera, et cetera. Positive, positive liberties in Isaiah Berlin's terms. And here's the problem. If you take this view, and you, you, I, can, I, I, I once held it myself, and I, I, it seems 
on its face, quite plausible and sensible, that you can't exercise, if you're starving, you're not in a position to exercise political liberty. Um, a, a French anti-liberal commentator in the late 19th century uh, said, uh, the law in its mag magnificence allows both rich and poor to sleep under the bridges. <laughs> it's a, a joke. Uh -huh. um, uh, the poor have to sleep under the bridge if they're going to have anything to cover them from the rain, and the rich don't have to because they're rich. So, so it just seems reasonable that you merge positive and negative liberty into one thing, which in English has become the word freedom. Now, here's the scientific problem with that. If you want to find out, as I do passionately, and, and one know, what liberty in the political sense, not being a slave, not being subordinated to your husband physically, not being subordinated to your master as an apprentice, not being subordinated indeed as a slave to a master, or indeed not being support, subordinated to the state. As uh, you know, April 15th just happened, we all paid our income tax. That kind of um, physically coerced, physic backed by physical power of one human over another. I want to know, and I think so do you um, in some moves, I want to know whether or not that causes enrichment. I've written three long books um, uh, claiming that it did. Uh, um, and uh, I, I, I believe I understand modern economic growth uh, better than you know many of my colleagues, Doug Norris and, and, and so forth. I think I've, I've, got, I've got the right idea, which is that it's liberalism, an 18th century creation, not older, that permitted people to invent and to uh, make the modern world. It's not investment, it's not exploitation that caused our enrichment. Look around us, here it is. It's liberty, at first constrained, only men with property could vote, gradually expanding to, um, in say the United States to end slavery in Britain in 1867 to extend the franchise to all men. Uh, and the anti-colonial movements of the of the uh, 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 the post Second World War movement again are extending uh, the women's mo movement um, in its early versions, uh, 1848 and all that, and then in its mo modern versions in the 50s and 60s, um, queer rights and, and and so forth gradually expanded the scope of permission. So you can't answer that question if you don't make a distinction between negative and positive liberty. If the question is, and I think it's a very important scientific question about the history of the modern world, is it the case, as Deirdre says it is, that liberty in this first sense, in this uh, ne negative sense, makes for prosperity causes modern economic growth is the reason we have rich and free countries under challenge, it, always. Um, you, you can't know it if you put together income or wealth 
with not being a slave. So my point that, that this was meant to be a preliminary sort of vocabulary point, but it, it, it's, it's my first main point. My second main point is that the kind of liberty that made the modern world and that characterizes a free society is not one of two popular kinds of, of uh, well, let, let me, let, 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 I should frame it this way. The basic idea and passion of liberalism, 18th century style, is equality. Adam Smith was for his time a convinced egalitarian. He was for all his life, unlike many of the Americans he admired, he was um, a, 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 an abolitionist, he was against slavery. He's a man about equality of, of rich and poor, black and white, whatever. The old theory since the invention of agriculture is that kings always win and women always lose. That's the hierarchical principle that our friends, the conservatives to this day admire. Inherited or intrinsic superiority of men to women, whites to blacks, British or French or Spanish or Portuguese to colonies and so forth is, is, is the conservative marching song. And what's unusual about 18th century liberalism then is it's egalitarianism. That's the core liberal idea that we're all, what's due to us is equal dignity, regardless of our condition in life. Well, there are two programs associated with this, which I said a few minutes ago are popular. One is the socialist program, which I was, um, that I advocated when I was a teenager and slowly extracted myself from, of equal outcome in the race of life. Think of, think of life as a race. Here's the beginning, here's the finish line. The promise of socialism is said to be equality of outcome. In the ideal social society, brain scientists and street sweepers make the same amount. We're equal. We cross the finish line, which sometimes happens in you know, bicycle or races. I've seen it happen where they hold arms and cross the line at the same point. And egalitarianism of outcome. Well, my proposition is that that works very well in a family or a small group of friends. If I buy a pizza for the party and I say, well, I paid for it, I'm going to eat all of it. <laughs> I'm not being a friend. So in small groups, this egalitarianism of, out of outcome is, is feasible. In a family, true, the mother and the father are kind of the, the bosses, but at least you're supposed to treat all the children equally. Uh, we, we find it quite objectionable if Cinderella is left at home while her si sisters are able to go to the ball and uh, uh, strive to get the hand of the prince. 
So that's that's the socialist ideal, but it doesn't work in big organizations or in big gatherings of people. In, indeed, in, in, in organizations, in corporations and in armies, um, what works is orders from the top um, uh, uh, and uh, what, what, what they call in the army unit cohesion. In the small groups that make up the large army, in, the, in a company of men, say, they must love each other, almost in a homoerotic way. But in any case, they must care for each other because in battle, that's absolutely essential. They can't say, well, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a maximizing utility under constraint person and I'm gonna run away when the first shot is fired, that's not gonna work. So in small groups and in, in groups of command, this equality, at least among the, well, among the friends or among the, the children or the subordinates works just fine. And it's an ordinary human uh, tendency and it's just fine, but it doesn't work at what in, at the level of which what Hayek called the Great Society, it doesn't work in three hundred and thirty-two million people. So that's equality of, of um, outcome. Then there's equality of opportunity, and for decades I thought, well, that, that that's right. We should that's only fair. We should have equality at the starting line. But I've grown increasingly clear that it's obvious that we can't have equality of opportunity. And that often our attempts to achieve it, as is also true of the equality of outcome, uh, uh, result in tyranny, in, in the opposite of a free, a free society. Now, look, if it, if it happened that everyone had the same quality of parent, if everyone was born in the same place in Paris instead of South Sudan, if everyone had the same, I don't know, mathematical ability or uh, dancing ability or singing ability, they're all... Ella Fitzgerald or Frank Sinatra, that would be fine with me. I'm a liberal. I'm an egalitarian. Yes, equal starting one. But it can't be achieved. We're too different. Maybe in some, actually, what's nice about the equality that I'm going to articulate in a few seconds, is that it, it results in, the, the kind of cliche is the, the rising of all boats. If at the 2% per year that the World Bank reckons world real income is increasing and has been increasing for a long time, continues as the World Bank and in its great wisdom thinks it's going to, if we don't screw it up, in something over a century, income per head, which is now in the world about $50 a day, think of Brazil or China, both have about the same per, per capita income now, is going to increase by a factor of eight. So instead of $50 a day, we'll have $400 a day, the current income in, 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 in Switzerland is $180 a day. In the United States, it's $130 or $140 a day. So in a little over a century, if we just carry on the way we are, we're going to be immensely rich. And then maybe this equality of both outcome and at the starting line are going to be roughly Correct. Look at the history of China over the last 40 years. 
once unspeakably poor at $2 a day, now, as I said, $50 a day. So neither of the popular equalities are possible. What's possible? Equality of permission. Women should be allowed to be airline pilots. Blacks should not be people slaves. Um, queers should not be attacked by the police all the time. People should be permitted, just permitted to, in the race analogy, they're permitted to join the race, regardless of where they start. And that I claim as a scientific proposition means this, that I, 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 I've mixed in philosophical and scientific arguments here, but as a scientific proposition, as I just said, liberty of permission leads massively to enrichment. And I claim that it's not the state that made us rich. It's not the clumsy attempts at equality of outcome or equality of opportunity. The clumsy and often corrupted and interested policies where the public schools become um, instruments of the teachers' unions and not instruments of creating equality of opportunity in, in the children, for example. Those didn't make us rich to be, to say, made me a very similar point. Trade unions didn't make us rich either. I belonged to two trade unions in my life. I didn't expect to be enriched by either of them. What enriched us was innovation, not capital accumulation, not gross theory, it's various forms, not exploitation to look on the Marxist side, but my favorite example, I can always point to it in any institution, dropped ceilings. Notice these ceilings, they're dropped and all the stuff is behind them. Isn't that nice? Uh, the cameras, the inexpensive steel, inexpensive wood, inexpensive clothing, inexpensive books, inexpensive, 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 the enormous enrichment of the last two centuries. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to end now, but I want to put forward one scientific fact, one observation, that any, any explanation of this enrichment or the free societies in which we live, to the extent we do, has to face up to. And that is that the magnitude, I'm a quantitative person, I'm an economic historian, I was trained by engineers, I want to ask always how big, how big, how big. And the increase since 1800 in income per head is $2 a day worldwide, with the exception of a few lords and priests, to $50 a day for the globe. Not every single part of it has shared in this, but on average, $2 to $50, a factor of 25, with still higher, exam higher uh, instances of this, such as the United States or Britain, which in 1800 were earning about $6 a day, which is still, imagine trying to live in Philadelphia on $6 a day. Um, now earning a hundred or hundred and thirty dollars a day. You can't pretend that redistribution, for example, will achieve that kind of change in the income per head of, of, of us all or of the poor among us. What achieved the 
enrichment in absolute terms of the poor of say the United States is invention. So I would propose here, I will in fact end, that we stop calling it capitalism, which is from, this, from the scientific point of view is an extremely silly word because it, it, it says, well, capital accumulation is what happened to us. That, that's what caused everything. Um, and that, that's wrong. It's just factually wrong. Um, I propose that we start calling it innovism because that's what liberty, equality of permission, invited. It, it made, it inspirited people to have a go, as the English say, to experiment, to try and fail, to try then eventually to succeed. And out of that came the modern world. And we must protect it. Thank you. Thank you. So the way in which we will proceed is perhaps I will have some questions from the internet and then uh, you can ask directly. So the first question is, we can agree that liberalism caused the great enrichment, but what caused liberalism? You've got to, got to read the third book of my trilogy. I was inspired this morning to bring it along to my office at Cato. Let's see if I can pull it out. Yeah, here we go. For that, you've got to read this book. It's 1,700 pages. No, not 70. It's, it's, um, it's 700 pages long. Um, and it tells how it happened. Um, and it, uh, it has all kinds of, um, all kinds, all kinds of evidence. There's this underlying quantitative point. Then there are, there are lots of qualitative arguments that need to be made. For example, in the time of Shakespeare, the middle class, the people in business were held in contempt. Shakespeare, though himself in business, um, all his heroes are either um, uh, otherworldly creatures or aristocrats. They speak in blank verse in his plays. Everyone else speaks in comical prose. By the time of Jane Austen, 200 years later, Jane is amiable, one of her favorite words, towards farmers, you know, Ricardian sense, the entrepreneurs in between the landlords and the, la and the laborers. One of her brothers became a banker in London. Uh, she's not hostile to the bourgeoisie. But that's not the only argument that's made in this book. I, I, the, the other two volumes are only 500 pages long. <laughs> um, but I invite you to, to read them. You, you don't have to read every word to kind of get the point. In fact, I always, in the beginning of each three of these volumes, I, I kind of summarize what, what it is I'm saying. Okay. A, a second question is, how do we formalize or operationalize the idea that freedom matters for economic growth? What is the causal mechanism here? By the causal mechanism, you need a ma mathematical um, statement. I had one, and I, it's at the end of the second volume. It's a, uh, it's a production function, just as a start, which has of course, Robert Solo's A term, because F of K of L has diminishing returns. Accumulation of capital without innovation, without a new idea of what to do, has sharply diminishing returns. Lots of you own an automobile. Well, if you're married or in a 
relationship, you might want to have two automobiles. It would be nice. It's all right. Um, what would you do with a third automobile? Or a fourth? Or a fifth? They would be junk out in front of your, in your front yard. There'd be no point to them. Diminishing returns. That's been our, that's been our touchstone for the last 150 years in economics, or indeed, actually since Malthus. So over 200 years. Scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. But it's a finding that gradually dawned on economists starting in the 1950s. Bob Solo's famous 1957 article, calculating the residual, as it came to be called, the A term that you multiply the F of K of L by. Um, gradually, it's become clearer and clearer that it's not physical capital or even human capital that explains enrichment. It's the A term. And that's innovation. And then you can ask, you can, you can specify, as I do algebraically in that chapter in the end of the second volume, um, what it depends on. It depends on rents in the economic sense, that is supernormal profits. That's pretty obvious. People don't invent things entirely out of just their desire to be interesting, but it also depends on the um, esteem, you might call it, with which the middle class is held. In a society in which, uh, say, like Soviet Russia, in which to be bourgeois is a crime, um, this A term is not going to work as well as it does in a society like the United States, where uh, outside universities especially, um, business people are held in esteem. So it can be formalized. It's not as if I'm just an English professor, although I was, and I don't like numbers and I don't like math. That's that's not me. I'm a, I'm a and I, I believe it can be formalized. You could even put it in an overlapping generations model, max U, subject to constraints if you want. Okay, thank you. A third question is how do the different categories of equality are interrelated between each other? How, for example, does equality of opportunity correlate with equality of outcomes and equality of permission? If everyone had the same equality, the same starting, then it's just a mathematical opposition, as it were, a logical, obvious truth that they would have the same outcome which is one of the reasons why it, 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 neither of them works. Um, it, would be, it would be this perfect, it would be the Garden of Eden in which we all started as Adam and Eve and ended up as Adam and Eve staying in the garden, God's pets. But we're not God's pets. I've just written a book on, a long book on um, economics and Christianity. I'm an Anglican, I'm an Episcopalian in which I argue that freedom of the will, as we call it in theology, is connected, is, nat uh, is a natural marriage with free markets. Uh, in free markets, some people have a good idea, some people don't have a good idea. So there's going to be a variation in income. But my main point about those two uh, equalities, equality of outcome, equality of, uh, of, um, of opportunity, is that they're impossible. Whereas we could do equality of permission this afternoon. We could take away all the hooks and chairs that prevent equality of permission. One, one simple example of thousands, millions, in fact, 
hooks and chairs put in the way of, of liberty, of individual and family, is the truth, the fact, in case you don't know, people in this country, whether Americans or not, cannot buy drugs from Canada. How odd, why would that be? Well, because the American drug companies had, have gotten to the United States Congress and have purchased it for a, a moderate sum. And the result is that Americans pay upwards of 10 times for prescription drugs than Canadians do. And this is, this is local, this is insane. But this is a result of, uh, I can see from my office at Cato, K Street. You can see it through the buildings. It's this constant irritation. Because K Street is the street of the lobbyists in Washington. And the K Street lobbyists paid for, there are approximately 1,500 lobbyists, not just their secretaries, but act, active lobbyists speaking to Congress people and to uh, and various people in the administration, 1,500 employed by the American pharmaceutical companies. So there are almost three times more lobbyists than there are people in Congress, adding up the House of Representatives and the Senate. <laughs> This is an inequality of permission. It's got nothing to do with equality of outcome or equality of opportunity, neither since they're impractical and are often disastrous. We might not care, but in any case, this is a strictly a strict piece of equality of permission. See a related question to that, and I have two questions that follow more or less the same idea. Probably in the last 10 years, or actually longer, the last 20 years, I've written something like <laughs> two or 3,000 pages making these points. So I tend to, you know, you, you, you press a button and out comes a 15-minute little lecture. So I'll try to control myself. Uh, yeah, a related question is, we could imagine a world where basically there is equality of permission at the beginning, but then even if the innovator is the one that contributes to, to the great enrichment by political economy incentives, he could co-opt the institutions and then create an unequal world at the end. Excellent point and true. It's a rough history of liberalism in the sense that I want to use it, namely the, the European sense since the 18th century. Um, almost immediately um, in the United States, for example, the tariff became a political football. New England wanted tariffs against British uh, cotton and wool and textiles and, and iron even, but especially bows. And the South, which was selling cotton to the was selling cotton to the British, didn't want a, um, um, a tariff, an external tariff on those, a protective tariff. Um, and indeed, that's the political economy. I just learned this after, this morning coming up on the train from, from, uh, from Dogville's great book, Democracy in America. If you, haven't, if you haven't read Democracy in America, Stop what you're doing and do it. It's an astonishing book. I, I am fond of saying to my um, right-wing friends that Karl Marx was the greatest social scientist of the 19th century without compare. And then I say to the left, and he got everything wrong. But, but, but I really do think that is the only competitor is Tocqueville. It's an astonishing astonishingly analytically sophisticated, rich in facts book. And I learned the fact that in 1832, 
there was an armed uprising in the South, 1832, 30 years before the beginning of the, of the Civil War, an armed uprising um, in the South against the tariff, armed especially in South Carolina, which, by the way, was the first state to secede from the Union in 1861. So, Yes, that's right. So all we can do against this very powerful political economy of interests is to preach against it. And I'm doing it. And I urge you to join me. Okay, well, one final question from the assistance here is about the scientific approach, how to approach this from a quantitatively aspect, is it possible to measure equality, either opportunity, outcome, or permission? Everybody asks that kind of questions about my books, my recent books. If you look at my earlier books, they're filled with numbers and simulations and so on. I've, I've not, although I was trained well in econometrics for a person of my PhD generation, I didn't ever use it for anything, mostly. I, but I used what I learned from my engineering colleagues and teachers. I learned simulation, and that's what I mainly do. Um, but they they open this book and look at it, and they don't see a lot of tables and numbers. And they think, oh, she's become an English professor or a philosopher and doesn't do real scientific work. Quantification is very important. As I said at the end of my presentation, it's the magnitude that's the problem. And it makes problems for all the, volume two is mainly about this, makes problems for all the usual explanations of modern economic growth. There, those other explanations are quantitatively unreasonable. They aren't, they don't have enough oomph, as I call it, to explain a factor of 25 or 30, sometimes a factor of 100, of increase in in income per person. Um, so yes, attitudes can be measured, uh, roughly. Or sometimes, you know, we, we do public opinion polls now. Why can't we do, as it were, public opinion polls on what humans have been writing for 4,000 years, we can do that too. We can count, um, we, can, we can count and assess changes in attitudes of ordinary people and of the elite. Um, we can certainly measure inequality of outcome. Um, um, although I, this, this present obsession with equality of outcome among economists, I find, um, a little bit pointless considering the rising of the of the tide. The enormous rising of the tide makes contemplating equality less interesting, it seems to me. We can we we can do this if we bring all the scientific evidence to bear. Scientific evidence is not the same as having a large sample, allegedly random and running a hyperplane through it. That's not the same thing as empirical work. A great many of our younger economists are convinced it is, and I wish they'd listen to the engineers or the physicists who never use our econometric techniques. They, in particular, they never use tests of statistical significance. Okay? Yeah, I go for us and sin no more. <laughs> so fortunately, I think we have reached kind of the time frame allocated to the class. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is the end of the course for those in the internet. So thank you for being Just here all week. Remind them that all the videos and the slides will be kept in the Yeah, yeah. The reminder is that.
Yeah, all, all the slides uh, and materials uh, will be in the internet, in the web page of the course forever. Thank you. Yes.